Tonight, a man in custody after plowing a stolen 18-wheeler into a Texas state government office. The violent crash leaving one person dead and more than a dozen others injured. The suspect backing up and ramming into the office more than once, trapping people inside. Police saying the suspect was denied a commercial driver's license just the day before. The chaotic moments leading up to this deadly crash. Also tonight, House of Trump. Former President Trump speaking side by side with House Speaker Mike Johnson at Mar-a-Lago. Johnson hoping his alliance with Trump will be a lifeline as he faces challenges from within his own party. Trump saying he's absolutely willing to testify in his hush money trial set to start Monday. And his new comments on abortion as the battle over reproductive rights ramps up. Lose the war? The dire warning from Ukraine's president saying without the U.S.'s help, the country faces the possibility of defeat against Russia. Their front lines in danger of collapsing. Russia closing in and ramping up attacks on Ukraine's energy grid. The new drastic measures the country is taking as it runs out of ammunition and men. Argentina's chainsaw politics. President Javier Milei, who campaigned with a chainsaw, cutting thousands of jobs and slashing government spending, inflaming tensions in Buenos Aires. Violent clashes as police blast demonstrators with water cannons. The president making his rounds in the U.S., meeting with Elon Musk as the country slides deeper into economic crisis. Rescue from above a dramatic helicopter mission in California. Rescuers hoisting a woman to safety as they dangle from the bottom of a chopper. The crash that landed the woman 200 feet down a California hillside. New Rat City, the Big Apple's clever new method to tackle the pest infestation. Or is it? Officials hoping birth control, which they claim tastes better than pizza, will take a bite out of the problem. Yes, they're considering giving birth control to rats. And good evening. Tonight, one person is dead and several others injured after a man stole a semi-truck and rammed it right into a government building in Texas. Take a look at this. Authorities painting a very chaotic picture of the moments before and after this crash, saying the suspect stole this 18-wheeler you see right here, then took police on a pursuit before ultimately crashing the truck into the Department of Public Safety building. Police calling for all hands on deck. That's great emergency. We'll need multiple trucks. This is going to be an intentional act. You was here yesterday. You heard it right there. Apparently, this was all on purpose. Officials saying the man was denied a commercial driver's license there just the day before. This all happening in the city of Brenham, Texas, around 70 miles outside of Houston. And that's where we find NBC's Priscilla Thompson, who starts us off tonight. Deadly moments in Texas. DPS, turn into DPS, it's crashing into DPS. After officials say this stolen semi truck plowed into a Department of Public Safety building in Brenham, tearing through an entire brick wall. There is entrapment in the building. Six people were rushed to the hospital. One died, and two are in critical condition. We're starting to get people out through these windows. Great emergency. We'll need multiple trucks. The suspect, Clintard Parker, is now in custody, authorities say, and no further threat exists. Parker did come to the DPS uh, Brenham office yesterday at approximately 3 or 4 p.m. where he was denied his commercial driver license. Maroon 18-wheeler, they left it running and it was just stolen. The crash occurred Friday afternoon after dispatchers say the truck was stolen. This is going to be an intentional act. He was here yesterday. Investigators say it appears the crash was deliberate. The law enforcement were behind this 18-wheeler. Uh, it was reported stolen. Uh, when they saw the vehicle, the stolen 18-wheeler took a hard right turn and went into the DPS Brenham office. The uh, suspect was backing the vehicle up and with the intent of going into it again, our fire chief mentioned that if he had veered a little bit to the left the second time, there would have been a collapse of that building. Priscilla Thompson joins us now from the scene of that crash. Priscilla, where exactly does the investigation stand tonight? Yeah, well, Tom, investigators are still on the scene here being led 
by the Texas Rangers as tonight the suspect remains in custody facing multiple felony charges and a short while ago two tow trucks actually arrived and so it does appear that they're going to begin trying to tow that 18 wheeler away likely continuing to investigate that truck along with what remains of this building. Tom. A scary time for the people there in Texas. All right Priscilla we thank you for that. We now want to go to that meeting at Mar-a-Lago late today. House Speaker Mike Johnson facing a threat to remove him from that job, appearing with former President Donald Trump in an effort to win over support and keep his post. But Trump making his own headline at the news conference saying he's going to testify in his hush money trial involving adult film star Stormy Daniels. Gabe Gutierrez asked him about that case and has this report. Tonight, on the eve of his Manhattan hush money trial, former President Trump defiant, saying he's willing to testify in his own defense in a case he slams as a partisan prosecution by a Democratic DA. Mr. President, do you plan to testify? Yeah, I would testify, absolutely. It's a scam. It's a scam. That's not a trial. That's not a trial. That's a scam. What they have done is incredible. It's election interference, and it's got to stop. It's a third world country. Mr. Trump facing the first criminal prosecution of a former president. He's charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records okay, and low-level felonies related to alleged hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. Isn't it risky for you to testify? I'm testifying. I tell the truth. I mean, all I can do is tell the truth. And the truth is that there's no case. They have no case. Jury selection set to start Monday. You know, jury selection is largely luck. It depends who you get. It comes as the former president is throwing a political lifeline to House Speaker Mike Johnson. We're getting along very well with the speaker. They are sharing the microphone at Mar-a-Lago, their first public event since Johnson was elected speaker last October. He has a razor-thin Republican majority and faces a threat from a top Trump ally, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, trying to oust him. I think he's doing a very good job. He's doing... Uh, about as good as you're going to do. And uh, I'm sure that Marjorie understands that. I know she has a lot of respect for the speaker. The yeas are 273. The nays but today, a victory for the speaker. The House passing the reauthorization of a surveillance bill that includes a controversial spying program over the objections of Mr. Trump. And then there's aid to Ukraine, which still has not passed the House. Ukraine's President Zelensky this week saying without it, Ukraine could lose the war. We're looking at it right now, and they're talking about it, and we're thinking about making it in the form of a loan instead of just a gift. Much more importantly to me is the fact that Europe has to step up and they have to give money. And late today, the judge in New York denied former President Trump's motion to delay the hush money case due to pretrial publicity. So as of now, jury selection is still set to begin on Monday. Tom? All right, Gabe Gutierrez from Mar-a-Lago. Now to that abortion battle taking center stage in Arizona. Vice President Kamala Harris on the ground there today addressing the state's Supreme Court's bombshell ruling that an 1864 law that bans nearly all abortions in the state is now enforceable. The VP slamming former President Trump calling the cause of this health care crisis. NBC's Dana Griffin is in Tucson following it all for us. Tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris at a rally in Tucson, slamming the Arizona Supreme Court ruling that enforces a Civil War era law banning nearly all abortions. Here in Arizona, they have turned back the clock to the 1800s to take away a woman's most fundamental right, the right to make decisions about her own body adding that former President Donald Trump is partly to blame. During his campaign in 2016, Donald Trump said women should be punished for seeking an abortion. And as much harm as he has already caused, a second Trump term would be even worse. Today on Truth Social, Trump writing, the Supreme Court in Arizona went too far, and we must ideally have the three exceptions for rape incest, and life of the mother. But the issue of abortion access goes beyond politics for women. Disbelief, anger. And doctors. We have the most vulnerable patients, and they're the ones who are going to pay the price. Um, the women who have five kids or four kids and are keeping a job or in abusive relationships, and I can go on and on and on. At this Phoenix Planned Parenthood. They were asking me, doctor, am I actually going to be able to have this abortion today? Dr. Jill Gibson says patients were shocked and confused, many calling the office for answers. I had friends calling me saying, was it still safe for their friends who are pregnant who are out of state to travel to Arizona to visit them? This is the atmosphere of fear that we have in, in the state for people who are trying to seek any form of reproductive health care. 
The 1864 law, which only makes exceptions for the life of the mother and makes performing abortions punishable by up to five years in prison, was decided Tuesday in a bombshell ruling by the state Supreme Court. It's a society's duty to protect human life in every situation. Dr. Eric Haselrig is the OBGYN who opened the door for that court's ruling after he petitioned for the case to be reviewed. Do you think women should have the right to choose what to do with their own bodies? I think that um, women should have the right to choose what they do with their own bodies within a certain context and with certain limitations. Some people in the state now galvanized to make their vote count in November when they will likely weigh in on an expected ballot measure to codify reproductive rights in the state's constitution. We want everyone to have a choice um, about their own bodies, about their own family planning. It's not a politician's choice. All right, Dana Griffin joins us tonight from Tucson. So, Dana, the attorney general has made it clear that she will not prosecute any doctors who perform abortions when this goes into effect. How are doctors responding and what are they doing to calm patients' fears? Well, Tom, the doctors I spoke with say they are not going to perform abortions until it is legal again. They tell me in the meantime, they are telling their patients they've got within two months to make their decisions. And one doctor tells me that he's actually opening this weekend because so many of his patients moved up their appointments because of this ruling and the confusion surrounding it. They say they're also going to work with neighboring states like California to get the women in Arizona, Tom, the health care that they need. All right, Dana Griffin for us from Arizona again. Dana, thank you for that. We want to head overseas now to the latest on the war in Ukraine. As Russia ramps up its attacks on critical infrastructure, top American and Ukrainian generals now warning Ukraine will lose this war if the U.S. does not send critical aid. NBC foreign correspondent Matt Bradley reports. <laughs> More than two years since its invasion, Russia launching a new offensive that could cost Ukraine the war, according to top U.S. and Ukrainian military leaders. Ukrainians on the front lines are running out of ammunition, men, and resources. The situation is extremely serious. And without vital U.S. support, top generals warn the situation will only get worse. A $61 billion aid package stuck in Congress for months, leaving Ukrainians exposed on the battlefield. If we do not continue to support Ukraine, Ukraine will run out of artillery shells and will run out of air defense interceptors um, in fairly short order. General Christopher Cavoli leads the U.S. European Command and oversees the multinational effort to train Ukrainian forces on battle tanks, F-16 fighter jets, and artillery. But General Cavoli says that as Russia steps up their attacks, the situation in Ukraine becomes more dire. Russia is currently firing five artillery shells for every one fired by Ukrainian forces, a disparity that could increase in the coming weeks to 10 to 1, according to Cavoli. Based on my experience in 37 plus years in the U.S. military, if one side can shoot and the other side can't shoot back, the side that can't shoot back loses. Top generals in Ukraine also sounding the alarm as Russian forces outnumber Ukrainian troops seven to ten times in the east. We're holding the defenses to the last breath, said this Ukrainian general. These remarks coming after parliament just passed a controversial new law to boost conscription, lowering the draft eligible age from 27 to 25. Sparking outrage and protests across the country. Our boys and girls in the service are very tired, said this local resident. They've been fighting for two years, and no one is planning to replace them. As the need for America's continued support only grows more pressing by the minute. Their ability to defend their terrain that they currently hold and their airspace would fade rapidly, will fade rapidly without the, um, without the supplemental, without continued U.S. support. Matt Bradley joins us tonight from London. So, Matt, as Ukraine is desperately asking for more weapons from the U.S., Russia is actually getting some foreign support as well? Yeah, I mean, Tom, when we're talking about all of those problems that Ukraine has in terms of supplies and weapons, Russia has all those same problems, too, and has for quite a long time. But Russia's Vladimir Putin has a friend in China's Xi Jinping. Now, Russia has been going to China asking for more weapons and help. And now NBC News is told by a senior American official that the People's Republic of China has been uh, providing materiel to the Russians, not necessarily a lot of hard weapons, but things like technology transfer 
transfers, microelectronics, other technology that is helping in its industrial base, not necessarily providing weapons itself, but helping Russia improve its industrial defense capacity, crucial to sustaining its now more than two-year-long war effort in Ukraine. Tom. Matt Bradley from London tonight. Now to the fears of escalation in the Middle East. Israel bracing tonight for a potential direct attack from Iran. President Biden warning that attack could come soon as the U.S. military moves fighter jets and warships into defensive positions. NBC's Hala Gorani has the latest from Israel tonight. Tonight, the Pentagon repositioning assets, including fighter jets and ships in the Mideast, in preparation for a potential Iranian attack against Israel. As President Biden is warning, a strike could happen soon. My expectations sooner than later. President, what is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. A U.S. intelligence assessment warns an Iranian attack could include a swarm of drones or land attack cruise missiles hitting Israeli diplomatic or consular facilities to U.S. officials tell NBC News. All of it almost two weeks after Iran vowed to retaliate for a bombing on its embassy compound in Syria that it blames on Israel, where several top Iranian military officials were killed. Iran is a top backer of Hamas and Hezbollah, and Iran's supreme leader has warned Israel, quote, will be punished. President Biden vowing support if a strike happens. We will defend, help defend Israel, and Iran will not succeed. The question now as the region braces for a possible retaliatory attack by Iran is when and how will Tehran choose to act? It would be a major escalation, all right. Halagrani. Still ahead tonight, the deadly shootout. Police in Memphis finding themselves in a gun battle with suspects inside of a car. At least one officer killed. The late details just coming in. Plus, crews descending 200 feet into a ravine in San Francisco the moment they rescued a driver who accidentally drove off the highway. And you may have seen the videos on social media, rats taking over New York City on streets, on subway platforms, even in restaurants. How city officials now hope to use birth control to try and prevent the estimated 3 million rats from multiplying even more. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with that storm system bringing record rainfall and dangerous flash flooding to the Northeast. The National Weather Service issuing a flash flood emergency for the city of Oakdale, Pennsylvania. That's just outside of Pittsburgh, which received a daily record of 2.7 inches of rain yesterday. Some residents stranded overnight. You see it here in the floodwaters. County officials telling us they've conducted more than two dozen water rescues. Tracking the storm system for us, of course, is NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens, who joins us in the studio. Bill, a big rainmaker there with that storm. What's happening tonight? Yeah, this storm was responsible for four flash flood emergencies on its path through Texas, and including New Orleans, Tallahassee, and then late last night, just outside of Pittsburgh. And it's still cranking in southern Quebec, and it's nasty. I mean, Detroit to Cleveland, Toledo, Erie, Pittsburgh, it's raining, it is cold, it's snowing in Canada. And we even have a winter weather advisory for western New York. It's going to snow four to eight inches tonight in western New York in the middle of April. So as we go through tomorrow at noon, snowing in the Catskills, snowing in the Adirondacks, it's going to be cool. It's going to be windy. And then this will finally blow out by the time we get through Saturday night. Sunday starts out great in the Northeast, but then quickly some showers and thunderstorms are going to roll through Pennsylvania and also in New York City to Connecticut as we go through Sunday evening. Keep that in mind. Sa Sunday starts great. Doesn't end that way. Middle of the country, you are fantastic. What a spring weekend, 80s and 90s. The next storm of concern comes into California tonight. It'll be with us throughout Saturday. Sunday, it begins on the move. And by the time we get to Monday, this storm is going to be a problem in the middle of the country. We have the potential for a severe weather outbreak and maybe even a tornado outbreak. And it's that I-35 corridor from Wichita to Oklahoma City down here towards the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And then by Tuesday, that severe weather threat continues into the Midwest. That'll be serious concerns as we go into the beginning of next week, Tom. All right, Bill, we're going to be watching that on Monday. Next tonight, New York City's rats are not taking the bait anymore, quite literally. The rodent population exploding and poison isn't doing the trick. So now city officials are considering rat birth control. You heard me right, rat birth control. Stephen Romo has a story and a heads up. Some of these videos you're about to see will make your stomach turn. New York City without rats? 
seems hard to imagine. What in the hell? But recent viral videos show a city overwhelmed with rodents. You got the pizza, you got the pizza. They're seen taking over sidewalks, living on subway platforms, and even scurrying around a very bright and populated oh, Times Square. Yeah. I mean, they're everywhere. I feel like you see them like running through the garbage piles. It's ridiculous. It's, it's a bad infestation. It's disgusting. I saw a mom and a baby rat yesterday. And New Yorkers are not just imagining it. A 2023 study by a pest control company estimated that the rat population jumped from 2.3 million in 2020 to nearly 3 million in just two years. A jump the study attributes to outdoor dining and sanitation budget cuts. It's coming right at me. Now the latest proposed fix, rat birth control. If it is a war on rats, clearly the rats are winning. The New York City Council considering a measure to deploy contraceptive food pellets around the city that would work on both male and female rats, since a pair of the rodents can produce 15,000 offspring in just one year. There are better ways of handling this rat crisis and is not poisoning our way out of it because it simply doesn't work. Rat poison can be harmful to humans if accidentally ingested and harmful to wildlife that may prey on the rats. Like New York's beloved Flacco, the owl who died in February, testing showed he had rat poison in his system. Dispatch, deprive, disturb. There have been other citywide efforts to target rats, something New York Mayor Eric Adams made a priority. Last year, he named a rat czar to try to fight that problem. What they can do to be part of the rat pack and start fighting rats. Businesses are also now required to put garbage in covered bins instead of bags on sidewalks, which rats can easily tear open and feast upon. As for rat birth control, City Hall saying they remain focused on this problem and are reviewing that newest legislation. Can help? Oh. While totally eradicating these furry friends is unlikely, limiting their numbers could be a big win decades in the making. Rats do run the city, 100%. That and pigeons, but that's another subject for another time, I guess. Yeah, that's another top story uh, segment. <laughs> All right, Stephen Roma joins us now in studio. We're laughing, but there's really nothing to laugh about. This is so gross. So they're going to give um, birth control to these rats. Is this the first time they've, they've tried something like this? They've actually tried it about 10 years ago. When I was looking, actually back in the 60s, they tried this as well with contraceptive for rats. Both of those times, though, it only affected female rats. This current time, it should go after male and female rats. If this is approved, they think it could uh, end up working better that way we'll of course have to wait and see if it actually works and just to go back to a point because it's it's just it's freaked me out two rats together can end up producing 15,000 rats through their kids and they keep breeding but out of two rats you can get 15,000 in one year shocking numbers right it's just to imagine all those generations of rats I don't know how many that is for one year but that is a whole lot of rats they're worse than rabbits it sounds yeah like. all right thanks for that Stephen Romo when we come back outrage in Argentina we're going to switch gears here protesters taking to the streets as an inflation crisis worsens but the country's president on his third U.S. trip in just four months the meeting he had today with tech billionaire Elon Musk stay with us All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a deadly shootout in Memphis, Tennessee. Authorities say officers were responding to a call about a suspicious car when the people inside started shooting, and officers fired back. One officer and one 18-year-old suspect were killed in the shootout. Two more officers were hit, but are expected to be okay. Another teenage suspect is also in critical condition. A former U.S. diplomat who spied for Cuba sentenced to 15 years in prison. 73-year-old Victor Manuel Rocha, who served as a U.S. ambassador to Bolivia in the early aughts, pleading guilty to charges he worked as a foreign agent for Cuba's intelligence agency for more than 40 years. The plea deal also includes a $500,000 fine. Prosecutors call this case one of the biggest betrayals in the history of the U.S. Foreign Service. And a dramatic helicopter rescue in Northern California caught on camera. Video showing crews descending 200 feet into a ravine in the San Francisco Bay after reports that a car had gone off the highway. First responders addressed the, uh, uh, sorry, assessed the driver's injuries at the scene before crews airlifted her out of the forest and delivered her to a nearby ambulance. No word yet though on her current condition. 
And we want to turn now to the Americas, where in Argentina, economic hardship and rampant inflation have sparked outrage on the streets. Protesters clashing with police. But Argentina's president is actually not even there. He's here in the U.S. for meetings. And today he met with Tesla CEO Elon Musk. NBC's Marissa Parra has the details. Argentina's President Javier Malay on a whirlwind U.S. trip. Today, meeting with tech billionaire Elon Musk at his Tesla factory in Austin, Texas. But his third U.S. visit in just four months, coming as protests erupt in Argentina amid financial turmoil. Police clashing with anti-government protesters earlier this week firing a water cannon to disperse the crowd. Demonstrators say recent measures taken by President Javier Malay to reduce government spending and curb rampant inflation have instead forced families to go hungry. Mal, mal, mal. Los chicos no tienen para comer, amigo. Los chicos están cagándose de hambre. Barrio que no están entregando mercadería. On Thursday, hundreds of university students took to the streets of Buenos Aires to protest budget cuts in education by Millet's administration. Estudiantes. Students say they have faced steep price hikes in transportation, rent and school utilities as their university's budgets get depleted without government assistance. Los estudiantes no podemos eh, llegar a fin de mes, donde tenemos que pagar un montón de plata para poder venir a cursar por más de que Argentina tiene una educación que es pública, que se supone que debería ser eh, gratuita y de, y, y de calidad, es de calidad. It's just the latest in protests and strikes that have gripped the South American country, struggling to rein in its stunning 276% inflation rate, the highest in the world by over 130 percentage points, up more than 100 percentage points since the country's election in October. Argentina's economy has been battered with high inflation rates for months before Malay took office. He ran and won on a promise to rein in inflation, but warned his supporters of a shock adjustment that would make the economy worse before it got better. Si bien vamos a tener que soportar un periodo de dureza, vamos a salir adelante. Now, Argentina's Minister of the Economy says, quote, inflation is slowing down sharply, but residents aren't so sure. No hay baja de inflación. Es pura verso. Back in the U.S., Millet is seen sitting down with financial leaders, like president of the Inter-American Development Bank, just days after the banking giant, HSBC, announced they were selling their Argentina business at a $1 billion loss, attributing the move in part because it had, quote, limited connectivity to the rest of our international network. For now, residents trying to carry on with their normal lives as their country grapples with economic woes. All right, with that, Marissa Parra joins us from our studios in Miami. Marissa, do we know anything more about the meeting between President Millet and Elon Musk? Hey, Tom. Well, it's actually interesting. The Argentinian government's official account put out a statement on, of course, Elon Musk's social media platform, X, where else? Um, and they laid out some of the talking points that they allegedly mm -hmm. talked about today, things like population size, things like freer markets. But they also discussed some of the things that they had collaborated on. One thing specifically, they said they'd agreed together to hold an event in Argentina soon to, quote, promote the ideas of freedom. Now, it's worth pointing out and worth noting that Argentina is rich in lithium resources, and lithium would be a resource of interest to someone like Elon Musk, who founded a company like Tesla, which, you know, it runs and needs lithium. And we know that Musk has previously discussed and called lithium the new oil. So listen, uh, today's meeting was a long time coming for several reasons. Uh, Millet and Musk have long publicly supported each other on social media. So meeting face to face officially today. Dom. All right, Marissa Parra, thanks for breaking all that down for us. All right, that does it for us tonight, and we thank you for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.